Because you will want to see some of this, I, and I'll uh, point out some things from certain scriptures that have been translated either wrong or in error or whatever. And uh, you have to see it. And that way you can, oh wow, I didn't know it said that. And then, uh, and then again, some of the words, when, when you see how the words are translated, it changes the whole idea. I mean, you can change a complete belief system just by one word and then defining it from its original source. And then it'll open up a whole can of worms of things. <laughs> oh, God. So let me just read you this. I wrote this. It says, Existence is a dance between the unmanifest and the manifest. Uh, there's several ways of saying that same thing. Existence is a dance between spirit, which in reality, when, when you say the word, or when we say the word spirit from the Hebrew, ruach, it really is non-definable. So if I said, what is spirit? I mean, it's hard to put a definition on what spirit is. It's, it's like, uh, it's undefinable. In other, but if I ask you what spirit is, you would probably say, well, I don't really know what you might say. <laughs> Matter of fact, what would you say? If I said, what is spirit? What would any of you, somebody just speak out and tell me. Breath. What you, breath, you'd say breath, Wind. okay. Wind. Wind. Anybody else? What would you say? If, yeah, well, let me ask. Well, let me say it this way. What if I said Holy Spirit? Peace of the Trinity. A what? The peace of the Trinity. The peace of the Son Trinity. Of the All right. So it's a third. So if I said Holy Spirit, you would think of a a third person. <coughs> would that be correct? Yes. No. Not yes. yes or no? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that's correct. Yes or no? Because that's how we're taught. That's what we're thinking. Yes. But Spirit, the word Ruach is undefinable. Because what is your breath? I mean, you know, we can say it's H2O. I mean, you know, from a physicist standpoint of view, it's H2O. Hydrogen, uh, two parts oxygen, uh, right? Water. Water. So, but but in, can you see it? No. You can't see it. No, Jesus no. said this like this. Jesus said. Can you see those trees moving? And he said, what's moving the trees you cannot see? But you can see the trees moving, waving, you know, they're waving, right? But you can't see what's making them wave. That's the Spirit. So Spirit's undefinable. That's why it's an undefinable word. You can't, you can't put any, any uh, definition on it. So if I talk about the unmanifest, I'm talking about the Spirit, and if I'm talking about the manifest, I'm talking about matter. But now you have to hear this. It takes the combination of the two, spirit and matter, to manifest anything. And spirit, without matter, i.e. unmanifest, is basically nothing. Because you can't define it. You can't see it. You can't... You couldn't possibly figure it out because you can't see it, you can't define it, so how would you figure it out? So it's basically nothing. So there's a lot of teaching that goes around that says spirit is the place of perfection or spirit is the place of, of total health or healing or whatever. So that's where you want to be and that's where you want to go. Well, if you want to experience nothing, that's where you want to be. But most people don't want to experience nothing. Hello? <laughs> Y'all really quiet, so I'm just assuming, thinking. That, and I, that's good. So let me just, existence is a dance between the unmanifest <coughs> and the manifest. In other words, between spirit and matter. The moment there is a manifestation, there is duality. Think, I'm just asking you to think about it. The moment there is a manifestation, anytime something appears or is manifest, there is a duality. There has to be a duality. The reason I say that, 
there has to be a combination of light and dark. Yes. There has to be. There has to be a combination of male, female. There has to be a combination of spirit, matter. If there's not, if there's not, then there is no manifestation. Now, I want to, if I were to give you a symbol, the scriptures, our book is a book from the whole, from Genesis to the book of Rep, is a book of signs and symbols. I mean, you know, years ago I had this lady, Dr. Fuchsia Pickett, who was one of my mentors. She was a phenomenal, phenomenal teacher. She started a Bible study, I think the name of it was Fountain Gate, uh, I mean, not a Bible study, but a college in Dallas, Texas, years ago, and I think it still goes on today. And she's been deceased for probably 20 years, and when I met her, she was probably, she acted like she wasn't, but 60 or so, but she was probably 100. <laughs> she was an ancient of days. But I sat under her for several years, and she was a tremendous mentor to me, and she told me, she said, Lynn, if you, if you never understand signs and symbols, then you'll never understand Scripture because the Bible is a book about signs and symbols. So I want to give you a symbol And that's a very common symbol. We could call it a pyramid. But that is a symbol for this word right here. Fire. That's the symbol for fire. Fire is a word that can be used for spirit. Spirit is fire. Fire is another word that can be used for light. L-I-G-H-T. God is light. I mean, I can, say, I can give you another scripture, Exodus, it says God is fire, consuming fire. Hebrews, Hebrews 12, Hebrews 13 says the same thing. God is the consuming fire. Or in other words, you could say fire, light, spirit, that's its symbol, a pyramid. And so when you go to Egypt and you see the pyramids, you can see the pyramids, but you cannot see the foundation of the pyramids and what's under the pyramid. Every pyramid has a very solid, deep foundation. That's material, matter. And underneath that deep foundation in every pyramid is a stream of water. The symbol for water is that. This is the symbol for fire. This is the symbol for water. And when you take these two symbols, the pyramid pointing up and an upside down pyramid, and you put these, these pyramids together like this, do you know what that's called? Star David. Star David. Now, so that's, that, that's a combination of symbols. So what did you do? You combine the unmanifest and the manifest, you, con you combine the male and the female. See, that, that's a symbol. And, you know, I, I, sometimes I have to talk about things that are sexual, but I'm not trying to do it in a, in a way that is dirty or things that needs to be talked about. That's the symbol for a phallic or that, that stands up. This is a symbol for a yoni or the womb that, that opens up to that. So these have to be combined. There has to be the combination of those two or there is no creation. There's no procreation. There's no life. Everything in nature is doing that. Combining the two, spirit and matter, fire and water. And so when, you, when we see that, and so when I'm talking about that, there's a dance between these two. And that dance is a dance of duality. And, and many times we think about duality in a negative way, like it's bad. You know, you don't want to be divided. And that's true because what you want to do with duality is combine the two so that they become one. And that combining the two so that they become one is called whole, W-H-O-L-E, or wholeness. Or you could say it oneness. So the combining of the two, spirit and matter fire and water. Though unity, oneness, that's what we were talking about, unity, oneness, is the basic fabric of, 
of creation, duality brings structure or substance or design or color to that unity. If that unity just stays as oneness or stays as spirit or stays as unmanifest or stays as no thingness, then there is nothing. Okay? And so many times what people call heaven or bliss are thinking about nothingness, and if you ever get there, you'll get tired of it. Because there ain't nothing to do. You get tired floating around on a cloud. You can't go fishing, because fishing requires duality. <laughs> okay. Okay, so all of the all of the various manifestations that we see as life are fundamentally rooted in duality. Every one of them. I don't care if it's a leaf, a, a blade of grass, a grasshopper, or a human being. It doesn't matter. Everything in the manifest world has its root in duality. It has its root in the male and the female. If they were only one, there would be no manifestation. Therefore, there would be no existence. So where do you want to put your focus at? That's a really important question to me. I think it is. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to put your focus? Do you want to put your focus in duality where there is a manifestation, where there is, I'll use it, reality? Or do you want to put your focus on the unmanifest where there is nothing, where there is no reality? To me, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> to me, it's simple. But in, in much of the community that's called New Age, there, and there are a plethora of books, hundreds and hundreds of books that are mixtures with good stuff and other stuff that will give you the idea that the place to be is in the unmanifest and call the unmanifest the nominal world mm -hmm. and call the manifest the phenomenal world. And that is a true, those are two terms that aren't used today in English. Mm -hmm. They were used 100, 200 years ago, especially in metaphysical or in uh, spiritual traditions. And those two words, nominal and phenomenal, have now been completely flipped and reversed so that they say now the phenomenal is the unmanifest and that's how we use it. We say, wow, something miraculous happened. It was phenomenal. But yet phenomenal actually means it's manifest. <laughs> nominal means it's not manifest. So it's amazing how, and to me, words are important. And I look at words, and I like to do, I love to do synonyms on words. I love to do research on words to go back. What did the word mean in its origin? What was it originally intended to mean? And when I do that, and I go back, and I think, whoa, have we got way off base? And I think sometimes being way off base was a purpose designed by religion to get us way off base so that we really don't know who we are, what we are, and what we're about. So for me to find out those things is, is vastly important. So what I want you to do, if you have your Bible, go with me to a, a very familiar passage of Scripture. I've been using it for the last few weeks. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. It says, and the Lord God, Lord God. That's two words that uh, the word Lord is the word that comes from a Hebrew, uh, it comes from a Hebrew glyph, which actually four glyphs, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And those, those glyphs, yod hey vav hey in Hebrew actually stands for carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. That's what they stand for. The basic building blocks that build anything in the physical manifest world. That, that, everything in the manifest world physically is built from carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. And of course you have on the, on the periodical table, you have like, what, 119 or 20 or I, I forget how many different gases and minerals to combine all of this that we see as the manifest world, which is a fact. But yet in ancient Hebrew, they, they went back to basics. Now this word, 
when we try to make an English word out of it, out of this particular word, yote vante, going from right to left in Hebrew, we made a word out of it by adding vowel points to it. You know what the word was we made? Jehovah. Jehovah. Now everybody now, you've probably heard of Jehovah. And what does Jehovah translate them to? Lord. Curios. Lord. Now, who is Lord? Well, Sarah called Abraham Lord, which was correct. And it's just like every wife should call her husband Lord, which is correct. <laughs> <laughs> she does. She goes, Lord. Uh, listen, to, listen to this. Every, <laughs> I don't see that. No, no, no. Every husband should call his wife Lord, which is also correct. Because, see, we have taken that one word, Lord, and we've made a religious term out of it, and we've used it in error. And we don't know that because we've been taught to do that. So I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. I'm not blaming anything or anybody. I'm just saying that actually just simply means manifest. So that's exactly who we are. We're carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. We're manifest. Every one of you is manifest. I see you. <laughs> I know you're manifest. You are here. Hallelujah. You are here and you're awake and you are aware. You're manifest, right? And that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. So you see this word Lord and then the word God. The first time that you see that combination of Lord God is in verse 4 of Genesis 2, 4. It says, And these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God, first, pli first time, the first place that you see that word Lord, which is this, this, God, hey, Bob, hey, which carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, in other words, the basic building blocks in the manifest world to build something, and then the word God. That's the Hebrew word Elohim. And that word God, or Elohim, which is used 32 times in Genesis chapter 1, actually means the astrological powers. Or I could say the 12 segments in the, in the astrological wheel or the circle. When I, when I say that, so I, let me try to make that clearer. If I draw the astrological wheel, you start, that's the basic, that's the cross in the circle of infinity, okay? Timelessness and time. The cross means, represents time. It's where the vertical has married itself in the horizontal. Yeah. That's time. And the circle represents no time. So what that circle with the cross in the middle of it represents is no time has moved into time. Now, that, that's a conundrum, right? Mm -hmm. That is a conundrum. No time has moved into time. Mm -hmm. And so that's the four basic building blocks where uh, you put these right here, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. It's the foundation of the astrological wheel, which you start out with Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Sagittarius, uh, Capricorn. Let's see, Sagittarius. Uh, what's the next one? Capricorn. Capricorn. Sagittarius. Boy, I mean, I'm missing one. It's, both of them starts with an S. Sagittarius. And, anyway. Scorpio. Scorpio. There you go. Scorpio. Sagittarius and Scorpio. Capricorn. Aquarius. And Pisces. That's your 12 astrological signs. That represents the Hebrew word Elohim. Or in other words, God. So, wow, you say, wow, Brother Lynn, you mean God is the astrological wheel? Absolutely, yeah. See, there, there are several different Hebrew words for the one word God in English. We have the word Elohim, which represents all 12 of these powers because it takes all 12 of these powers to create you. And then there's the word, if you segregate just one of these sections of the pie, it's called El, which means power. So every one of these sections, 12 sections, is power, filled with power. And that's the Hebrew word El, 
It's also translated for the word God. And there's several other words, but when you talk about Elohim, you're talking about the entire astrological wheel. That's the timeless. Move into Jehovah. That's matter. And so that's the same as this star of David. It's the same thing as fire and water being merged together. So when you see that word Lord God in the combination of the two words, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about that that is spirit has moved into that which is matter for creation's purpose. Do you understand that? Okay. okay, so, and I know that's a little different, and I know that sometimes it's difficult. So verse 7 again, and you, you don't see this as much as you think you would other than right here in the first <coughs> parts of Genesis, maybe the first 12 chapters, you'll see that combination of Lord God, and then you'll hardly see it that much the rest of Scripture. You'll either see them use the word Lord, when always use it, when they use the word Lord, it's always referring to the manifest. Carbon hydrogen. As always, if they use the word God in a singular fashion, they're always using to the divine powers, the twelve powers, the astrological wheel. But here in a combination of the Lord God, that's that's the unmanifest and the manifest. The Lord God formed, that's the word gets and actually it means to, to squeeze out. Just like you were taking a play dough <laughs> and shaping something. That's what it says. Man, the word man here is Adam, Alif Dalit Mim. And that word again is referring to Human. the Lord. Okay. Of the dust, that word dust is actually Afar. And the word Afar in Hebrew means particles of light. Or I could say dust, D U S T, light dust. And now the quantum science actually found this out. They proved this beyond a shadow of doubt that back in 1936, that you are literally a light being. Mm -hmm. That the cells in your body are light. That's what they're electricity. They really are. So actually, all the all the 60 trillion to 100 trillion cells that make up your physical body are light particles. Every one of them. And quantum science knows that today, and the medical field knows that today. The Christian community don't know that today because they, they thought, you know, you just, you just made up dirt. You're just a dirt bag. That's what they call us, dirt bags. <laughs> but you really are not. You're really a light bag. You're really, you're really an amalgamation of light particles. All kinds of colors of that light make up who you really are, and that's what this is saying. So the dust... Of the ground, the word ground don't mean dirt. It comes from the Hebrew word Adama. And many times the word that you think of for ground would be in the Hebrew Eretz. But the word Adama comes from the root word Adam. Adama just simply means miracle substance. And that would be the carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. That is a miracle substance. And when it's combined correctly, in the right recipe, it creates anything. But it has to be in the right recipe. And who knows how to do that? Nobody. <laughs> Only God. Only the source has that intelligence to do that. And it knows how to do that. It knows exactly how to do that in the womb of your mom. And create you. And then move into you and say, huh, oh, this is my house. So this is where I live. Okay. And so here's the word I want to get to. Formed out of the ground and breathed. Everybody say breathed. Breathe. 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 And that's, uh, that's something that I would like to talk about. He breathed into this man. And we're going to look at, at what happened when he, this breath, this exercise of breathing is accomplished, then... Uh, we have, we have voila, we have life. Without that breath, without that inhalation, bringing that into me, without that breath, then we don't have life. Is that correct? Yeah. Breath in, life, breath out, gone. What do we call that? S cessation of being. You cease to be. They decease. That's a, that's a better word to say. They decease. And, I, and I, I, would, I wished I could rewrite the, the language or the vocabulary of understanding 
we would call it death or they died, right? Mm -hmm. But if you remember two or three weeks ago, a month ago, I told you that's, a, that's the wrong use of the word die. Because when you take the word die, like Jesus, or like Paul in, the, in Corinthians, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die. Now ask yourself this question. If a grain of corn or tomato seed or squash or okra, if it ceased to be when you put it in the ground, would it produce? Couldn't produce. So actually, what did that grain do when you put it in the ground? You put it in the environment that's designed for it to do something. And what is the environment of the ground, the water, the moisture, and the warmth? What is it designed to do? It's designed to cause that seed to become what the seed is designed to be. So the seed didn't die. The seed began to become what it's designed to be. So if you put that ideology in, your, in yourself and you realize, if I die, actually I'm just going to start being who I'm designed to be. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the proper use of the term and understanding of the term helps us to move ourselves further on in what we're supposed to be because every one of us have been planted as a seed of God. What does that mean? As a seed of God, then I must die. I.e., I must become what I'm designed to be. And our problem has been, we have not known that we are to become what we are designed to be, so we don't know how to become what we've been designed to be. <laughs> right? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. So our whole life is about becoming. Yeah. And... You know, the sad thing about that is that really doesn't even happen in anybody's life until they're around 16 or 17, 18. And then they have the potential to start. And there are very few people that start becoming at a younger age because we're too, we're too overwhelmed in the phenomena of the sensual self. And it is. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So he breathed. Now I want to put the word breathe up here. Uh, it's the Hebrew word non fe I believe it's the che, uh, breathed. Breathed. Yeah. non fe che -ot. And the reason I put this up here, I'm going to put several other words up here. This is breathe. Breathe. The non has a 50 value. And I'm, I just do this numbers because, see, you can manipulate words. You can uh, twist words. And they've done that to us. And that's why we have so many false definitions of words. But you can't manipulate numbers. Numbers don't lie, period. I mean, if your bank account says zero, I'm going to tell you, you can bet that. You can go to the bank on that. If it says zero, it's zero. Numbers don't lie. And the, this right here has an eight, uh, has a uh, tail has a eighty value, and this right here had, had I'm sorry, fay tail has a eight value. So if I combine these numbers and I put them together, I would have eighty and fifty would be what, one hundred and thirty, huh? Yeah. Is that right? One hundred and thirty-eight. Would that be correct? Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. That's correct, right? Jay Hop? Okay. And so that word in Hebrew is na, that's the noun, fe, cha. So it's pronounced nafia. That's how it's pronounced, nafia. And so I'm going to share several words with you, three particular words with you this morning. That word, nafia, and, and it becomes the word breath. It means to inflate. It means to become. That's what it means. So you can't become 
until you've been breathed. But when you've been breathed, now you can become. You follow that? Okay. So th that's, that's what's happening. We want to do that. We want to become. And we want to be breathed. Now, and I'm going to come back to this word, this passage. So you, but I want you to just go across the page or come down the page to verse 20, verse 21. 2.21. Genesis 2.21. Everybody found it there? Yeah. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep Deep sleep. Deep. The word deep in Hebrew is, and I, I know sometimes this gets to be a lot. I'm just, just hanging here with me. The word deep is tardama. And really what the word means, deep, tardama, it means to be engrossed in matter. Every one of us are engrossed in matter. What do I mean by that? I mean, I'm in this physical matter body and I'm totally engrossed in it. And therefore, this physical matter body is, it is a miracle. I mean, it is. Everything about this physical matter, every, it is a miracle. You can't figure your eyeball out. The intricacies, the, the, the different things, literally hundreds of thousands of things that goes on in your eyeball, to give you an ability to see. It's phenomenal. <laughs> it is. It's beyond finding out. And that's, that's just your eyeball. What about your taste buds? What about your smell, your hearing, your feeling? See, everything about you is so beyond finding out. It's just phenomenal. And so that, when I see this, when I see this word deep, that's what it's talking about, being deeply engrossed in matter. Now, I want to ask you a question. It's, th this thing's so phenomenal, things taste so wonderful. Is it easy to get addicted to how a thing tastes? Yes. <laughs> well, of course. Is it easy to become habitual by how something smells or how it's, you see it? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Do you think that a little three, four, five, six, eight, ten-year-old Baby, I'll call them baby. Do you think it's hard for them to easily get engrossed in their matter body? Yes. Oh, we all have, we all did, and we all still do. We are. We get, we get stuck. And that's what that word deep means. Now, this next word is where is really a, it's a, this one to flip you up. The word sleep. Now, when we see this word sleep, actually it's the word yashin. And the word yashin means to confirm in habit. Now, listen to this deep. I'm engrossed in matter. Yashin, they translate it sleep. It says, now I confirm in habit. So now that I'm in this matter body that everything feels so good, is it very easy to build habitual habits? Oh, yeah. It starts right out of the starting gate. I mean, that baby, by the time he's six months old, he has already been deeply immersed into his matter body, and now things are so sensual, so, so wonderful, it's easy for him all of a sudden to get habitual. I've got to have something. I've got to have some milk. Yeah. And so what is he going to do six months old? Ah! <laughs> Why? He's already developed a habit. Is that wrong? No. It's just the way life works. And so what happens from that moment on? Well, most of them begin to take control of their life. Don't they? Yeah, they do. They all, yeah, y'all yeah, yeah, you did. You sure did. You took control of your life. And you learned how to manipulate your life from anything and everything around you. You learned to do it. And so I wrote this note. I want to... We spend the first, we spend the first 16 to 18 years of our life learning everything the sensual way. That's the only way you'll learn. 
is you learn it the sensual way. We learn to do it sensually. We, how it feels, how it smells, tastes, looks, or sounds. Mm -hmm. We learn that. Then we get totally hooked on it. Mm -hmm. Haven't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Still are. Getting totally hooked on it. Tardama. That means we're occupied deeply in matter. That's what that word means. Then our, our sensual being, which is not wrong, our sensual being, then we spend the rest of our life from this addiction or this habit or this thing that we have done and that's not right or wrong, it just is until, until we come to a place in our life and sometimes it's later on and sometimes it's never. Until we come to a place and we realize, now wait a minute, this habit or this sensual addiction that I have, it may not be serving me for my greater good. And then you're going to try to do something about it. Now, how's that working for you? <laughs> it don't work good. You know why? I'm addicted now. I mean, this is all too good, and I ain't about to change none of it, bless God. It tastes too good, feels too good, looks too good, smells too good. I ain't changing it. <laughs> so we spend the rest of our life addicted to those sensual apparatuses not right or wrong it ain't going to send you to hell it'll just make you feel like you've been there <laughs> you see and, and see nobody has ever took the time to tell me there is another way nobody has ever taken the time to instruct us that scripture gives us the idea or the way to change all of that because that's how we're designed. That's how we're, des we're designed to be this way. It's not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. It's the way we're designed to be. And the choice falls right back on you as to how you want to live and what you want to do with it. It's like this little story that Sad Guru tells. I, I see if I can remember how to tell it. That this, this priest... Had, uh, had these two little boys and uh, the younger one, they decided that they wanted to try to find out why these little boys were so mischief. I mean, you know, it doesn't mischief fall in the category of little boys? Yeah. <laughs> That's because y'all didn't raise little girls. I raised three little girls and I can tell you it falls in the category of girls too. <laughs> <laughs> so they decided they, they wanted to Asked these little boys what, about how come there was so much mischief in these little boys. And so they decided they would take the youngest one first. He was about six or seven or eight years old. So they brought him into this priest's office and set him at the table. And the priest in his robe and his garb looking around at the little boy. And the priest saw, how can I really get his attention? What can I do? And so the priest says, where's God? <laughs> and uh, the little boy, he... Uh, he was kind of looking around and he, he wasn't sure what the priest meant. Where's God? And the little boy was looking under the table and around in the room. And, and uh, the priest saw that he was kind of confused him. So the priest got up closer to him and uh, got real right, right close to him, right firm in front of him and said, Where's God? And the little boy, now he's getting kind of nervous. He thought, Oh no. And so uh, the priest saw these still. The boy, the little boy's confused. So he walked around and, and he thought, Well, I'm going to give him a hint to where God's at. So he tapped him on the chest and he said, where's God? And the little boy got all nervous. He jumped up and he ran out of the room and he ran out to his little brother outside. And he said, oh my, we are in trouble now. And his little brother says, wow, what did you do? He said, they have lost their God and they think me and you got him. <laughs> good picture of what religion's done to us. Yeah. <laughs> because we have lost the beauty of this book and most people can't read it, don't read it, and won't read it. I don't blame them. It's been so manipulated and twisted we don't know how to extract the beauty and the depth of the truth that's in it. And when we do hear it, just like I'm trying to explain it, break it down, I've spent my life doing this. This is me. This is what I do. This is a part of who I am. 
And, and that's not right or wrong. It's just, that's just a part of who I am. This is what I have spent the last 30 something, nearly 40 years of my adult life trying to find what is the truth? You know, and, and I'm still asking myself that question. Here I am at my right young age asking the same question and still getting answers. And I have found out that probably if I live to be 100, 110, 120 year old, most likely I'm going to still be digging and asking these questions. What is the truth? Why? Because my life is on a quest that I would like to know what the truth is. And I have found that hidden in these tremendous stories is the truth, but it's not easy to find. And it sometimes it's very difficult to extract and to pull it out. So when we talk about deep sleep, people thinking, and they and I know I know that there, there are a lot of schools of thought that says that you're still asleep because God never woke Adam up. There are schools of thought that teach that and preach that. And so this whole natural world in that ideology is a world that we have created in our state of sleep. And that's just not true because what the word sleep, if you see it, it hadn't got anything to do with what I hope y'all did last night. Did y'all get any sleep last night? <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Well, the sleep was a time to rest and refresh yourself, correct? A time to rejuvenate, a time to rebuild the structure called the physical body that we tore down the day before. And how did we tear it down? We tore it down by abusing it. We tore it down by uh, working it, by feeding it, by anything that the things addicted to gave it to it. And so we broke it down, didn't we? And so at night is a time where God says, okay, you're out of the way. I'll try to do some restoration here on this thing and I'll do it sometimes through your dreams. Have you ever had a dream and wake up in the dream and you're just in a nervous sweat? Mm -hmm. So what was happening? You weren't really doing anything because you were asleep, but God was working the glandular structure of your body. Remember last week we talked about the glands. God was working the glandular structure while you were asleep to release certain adrenalines, certain hormones, certain oils. Remember the Christ, the Christos, releasing those oils in your body to do restoration work on the body that you and I are destroying. That was sleep. I pray to God you're not asleep right now. Because <laughs> if you are, you're not going to hear a word I'm saying. So, the whole school an ideology that says that we are just in a sleep and really when we win our wakefulness is when we go into the unmanifest world. And if you go into the unmanifest world and think you're going to wake up there, I'm sorry, you're in for a rude awakening. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. That's not where it's at. So, having said that, I want you to go with me to... Uh, <clears throat> Back, back over to Genesis 2, 7. I mean, back to verse 7. We were in verse 21, deep sleep. Back to verse 21, it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became. Everybody say became. He became. He became. Hayat. Actually, it means to exist. It means to, to the word became means to be yourself. To, to exist are to be yourself. Yourself. Well, who is yourself? You could say myself is who? I? Mm -hmm. Huh? Would you say I? Mm -hmm. Could you say I am myself? Mm -hmm. You really are. I am, I am yourself. Well, let, me show you, let me give you another word that we have, we have taken. The word I and self are ancient words. They go way back. Like, for instance, the word I in Hebrew is ane, ani, and that word I, ane in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, go, this is going all the way back to Egyptian stuff, thousands of years. It means I, and the, in, the, the newer English word that we've come to use <coughs> is ego. Who is your ego? Your ego is your I, yourself. That's who your ego is. It's your I, 
-hmm. It is yourself. Yeah. Now, many times we think, wait a minute now, is my ego mm -hmm. that part of me that's destroying my life? Could be. But it could also be the little child that never grew up that needs nourishment, needs love, and needs training. That's right. And that's every one of us. Yes, it is. So right now, when I'm talking about your ego, your I, yourself, I'm talking about that part of you that needs love. It doesn't need to... You know what? We, we have a lot of people think, well, I'll just stick my ego off in the corner or in the closet. That's wonderful and fine until somebody really pushes your button. Do you know what I mean when I say really pushes your button? You're going down the road, you're minding your own business, you're traveling exactly the same speed, and some guy or some woman, or it's always a woman, does it? For me. <laughs> <laughs> pull right out in front of you. I mean, don't say, you just pull, and you just slam on your brakes, and your button got pushed, didn't it? In other words, your ego popped right out of the closet, and what did it do? What did it do? A lot of you drew up beside them and you did that, that one finger thing. <laughs> uh, you, uh, yeah, you, uh, you need to use that F word. You did that. <laughs> hey, does it happen? And that's your ego. So the best thing you do is get rid of that and destroy it. No, that's not the best thing to do. The, and the best thing is not to stick it in the closet because it will come back out. The best thing to do is to bring it out of the closet Begin to love it, begin to nourish it, begin to look at it, begin to listen to it. And begin to start training it. Begin to just try to say, look, there is another way. There's a better way, and this way will bring peace, and it will also bring wholeness, and it will bring maturity. Right. It'll grow us up. Or you can be 70 or 80 or 100 year old and still have that ghost in your closet. Mm -hmm. Most of us do. It's just a matter of getting it out, bringing it out so that we can train it, so that we can teach it, and we can bring it to the place that it should be. So, this says right here that man became a living. Everybody say living. Mm -hmm. Che. This word che ah, living. Che ah. And actually, it means to be whole. Everybody say be whole. Be, be whole. whole. It means to be complete. Be whole. And it means to uh, be, to, to, uh, to uh, be saved. Same thing. That's what it means. Cheya in Hebrew. Cheya it means to be whole. W h o l e. Be saved. Now I want you to go with me. Just hold your place because we're coming right back over here to Genesis to go over to the book of James in the New Testament toward the back of your Bible. Just go to the index and you'll tell you what page and go right there and you'll find the book of James. Find the book of Hebrews and it's the next door. The book of James. James chapter 1. Everybody got it? James chapter 1, look at verse 21. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted, that word engrafted is inborn, and that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to in, engraft or impart into your being Seeds of truth, in other words, these seeds of truth are inborn mm -hmm. in you, and, and they'll, they'll produce life. So that's what it means when it says the engrafted word, the engrafted word, the inborn word, which is what? Which is what? What does it say? Which is? Able to what? Save. save. Now, Jesus came to seek and save. Now, in, in, when you turn to the New Testament and you start hearing that word save, what do you think? Born again. You think coming to it, you think about coming to an altar, you think about asking Jesus into your heart. Yeah. Is this correct? Mm -hmm. You're thinking about now, what do I need? I need to get saved from what? Saved from what? I need to get saved from yourself? 
from the devil. <laughs> I need to be saved. The word, the word in Greek, that word right there, save, which is able to save, or when Jesus says that he came to seek and save, same word, the Greek word is sozo. The Greek word sozo means exactly the same thing as the Hebrew word cheo, living. Be whole, and that's just, it means the same thing right here. It means to be whole, it means to be complete. It doesn't mean to pray a prayer, ask something in your heart that you've already got in your heart, and think that you are saved. Mm -hmm. And that, the church is filled with this. It, it's the gross error. It's, it's really a sad error. Every one of us are seeking wholeness. Yeah. Wholeness is to bring your ego out of the closet and love it and nurture it and train it and teach it how that it can be. And notice it's, what it says. It's able to do what? Save your what? Soul. It's able to save your soul. Now, go back with me to Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at that same word, soul. And this is right here. I'm going to kind of wind down on this, but this will set us up for next Sunday because I, I'm fixing to blow your mind. I, I know I, I haven't <coughs> blown your mind at all this morning, but I'm fixing to blow your mind. Okay? which is able to save your soul. The word soul, the word soul right here, let's just, let me just put this word on the board. And you're going to see these, these similarities. Okay? That's the word for soul. You see the similarity in these two words? The word breath and the word soul? The only difference is the last glib. This one has a chat, this one has a sheen. That's the only difference in those words right there. The soul and the breath. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 3. And, and the words, this word right here, nafesh, nafesh, sheen, nafesh, this one right here, nafesh, cheat. These two words have, a, have tremendous similarities, the breath and the soul. So they have a tremendous connection to each other. <coughs> this word soul can also be used for this word right here. It's the same identical word. Mind. How many of you have a mind? Mm -hmm. What does your mind do? Mm -hmm. Your mind's a thinking machine. It, and that's not wrong. That's just what your mind does. Mind thinks. That's what mind does. Now, mind don't just think. Did, did you realize mind has a filing cabinet? It's called memory. Your mind stores your memory. Your memory can serve you or haunt you. Mm -hmm. Mind does. <laughs> Your mind will help you or hurt you. Mm -hmm. Mind does. Yeah. So that's what, that's what your mind does. But yet mind is a gift that you have. And so you can let it do either one. You can let it serve you or you can let it hurt you. You can let it help you or you can let it haunt you. Mm -hmm. It's totally up to, it's, it's up to us. So God gave us all this. And, and the thing about it is, how many of y'all remember this? And I, this is probably not a good phrase. That God's not an Indian giver. And that's a real bad phrase because of the, the trying to say that Indians... Uh, yeah. That, in other words, actually the truth is God gives you something and God don't draw it back. That's the truth of the matter. In other words, God gives you something. And, listen to this, when God gives you something, God don't judge you for using it. If God gave you a free will, do you think God's going to condemn you and damn you because you use it? Huh? <laughs> What does that mean, God gave you a free will? It means God gave you the ability to make a choice. Mm -hmm. So you can choose whatever you want to choose, and God honors that. Mm -hmm. God honors that. So if you make a choice, and that choice is not serving you for your greater good, God honors that choice. Can you change it anytime you want to? 
Anytime you desire, you can change it, and God will empower you to do the other. So you have to remember that, and it's not right or wrong. I, I realize it's difficult for us to understand because we think, oh, if you make wrong choices, then God will, God will just beat the hell out of you. God will send you to hell. God will condemn you. Well, that's ridiculous. For a God to give you this ability to make a choice and then damn you for making a choice. Mm -hmm. Who in the world wants to serve a God like that? <laughs> I don't have that's schizophrenia. <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. Now, here's this is going to be this is going to be a, another place that's kind of difficult here. It says in Genesis 3, 1, it says, Now the serpent. Everybody say serpent. 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 Let's see, how does that, how does that spell? I'm going to have to get me another marker. This is getting where it's not marking too good. Check off. That's eight. No, and that's 50. She. This is the word for serpent. If I took this word, 50, <coughs> and the fay is 80. And the sheen is 300. If I done gematria on these numbers, this would be 380, and 50 would be 430. Was, is that correct? Mm -hmm. yep. Huh? Yes. And if I added those numbers together, what would I come up with? Seven. Perfect. Exactly. Now, if I took this is the word for serpent. Now, when I, when we read now the serpent, what did you think? Snake. The snake, exactly. You thought the devil, right? Mm -hmm. You talk, You thought about that guy that uh, slithered up in the tree and started to talk in sweet nothings to this woman. Isn't that what you thought? That's not what the story tells. That's how it's kind of translated. That's not what it tells. And, and I'm going to show you why I say that. So if I took this number right here, 300, and 50, that's 350, and 8 would be what? 300 what? 358. And then I added that together. 5 and 3 is 8, and 8 is 16. And if I added that together, what do I got? 7. Got the same thing. So the soul and the serpent have both got a numeric value of 7. Now what is the numeric value of 7? Numeric value of 7 is the number that refers to the physical body, which is the perfect, complete body that God built to live in. It's built with the seven endocrine glands. So when I say that, so you say, Brother Lynn, you're trying to say that the serpent here is, is a symbol of the physical body? Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Now, this word serpent, I want to take you for a little tour through the Old Testament, so be sure to get your finger in your index, and I want you to see something here. If you will go with me to the book of Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, just follow me through over here, Leviticus, Numbers, there. So go to the fourth book in your Bible, Numbers chapter 21. Everybody got it there? Mm -hmm. Look at verse 9. Everybody see that? What does it say? And Moses made a serpent. Do you see that word serpent? Mm -hmm. It's this word right here. Same word. Nafeshim. Mm -hmm. Nafesh. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it on a pole. Hold your finger right there and go with me quickly in the New Testament to the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. Everybody there? Yeah. Look at verse 14 and see if this is quoted. 
It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. You hear that typology? Now, if you want to put the Son of Man there and insert Jesus and put Jesus on a pole, i.e. a cross, it is a symbol of the serpent. That's a quote. That's almost a direct quote from right here where we read it in Numbers where Moses took a serpent and put it on a pole. Now, you automatically take that word serpent and think of it being a snake. Or you automatically take that word serpent and think of it being the devil or Satan. Are you trying to sell, say to me that in John chapter 3 that it's saying that Jesus was a snake or the devil on a pole? Huh? You wouldn't dare do that, would you? But that right there in John is a quote from the book of just like we just read right there, the book of Numbers, where Moses is taking that typology, symbol, symboly, of a serpent on a pole. And that word, now the word for snake in Hebrew is sa'ir. That's the word for snake. But the word serpent is nafeshin, nafesh. Now, can you hear that? Nafesh, that's the word for serpent. The word for snake, sa'ir. You hear the difference? Well, just to hear the difference, you've got to know there's a difference. So, if the nafesh is not a snake, so in Genesis chapter 3, it's not talking about a snake slithering up in an apple tree and asking a woman to take a bite of the apple. That's a dumb story. But we've all been told that story and we kind of believe that story. But it's not true. So let's see if we can figure out a little bit more about this serpent. So go back with me now to the book of Genesis, if you will, real quickly. Uh, Genesis chapter 30. Just a couple, like I said, get your finger in your index because I want you to go to a couple of places. Genesis chapter 30. And you'll have to see this in your own Bible before you believe it. But I will, I will challenge any one of you and every one of you and anybody that sees this on a video or hears it on a cassette or just sitting here. And I'll challenge any of you. Get you a concordance. Get you a Greek and Hebrew. And it don't matter to me which one or who, who wrote it. And just look up what I'm saying and you'll see it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Did everybody find Genesis chapter 30? Yeah. All right, look at verse 27. It says, And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, for I have learned by experience. You see those three words? Mm -hmm. Learn by experience. That's this word right here. That's this word right here, nafesh. Mm -hmm. Just look it up. It's the Hebrew word nafesh. So you mean, Brother Lynn, the word nafesh, serpent, means to learn by experience? That's exactly what it means. Ain't got nothing to do with the snake. Ain't got nothing to do with the devil. It mean, do you understand? You, a child, if he puts his finger on a hot stove, what did he just do? He learned by experience not to touch that thing. Will that stick with him the rest of his life? The rest... So learning by experience is something you do in your physical body, mm -hmm. in your mind, in your soul. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, so you see, your soul and the serpent have a great similarity. They learn things by experience. And experience sometimes is not your best teacher, but sometimes it's the most enduring teacher. Mm -hmm. Many times we won't allow ourselves to be taught because we won't submit ourselves to a teacher. We won't bring ourselves to a place to where we can discipline ourselves to hear and learn by the experience. But that's what that word means right there. Learn by experience. It's the same identical word. Nafesh. Okay, it's used several times. Now go with me real quickly to 1 Kings. I'll just take you for a little tour. Just a couple of verses and then we'll close because I'm way out of my time frame right now. I need to quit. 
I know that you get it. First Kings chapter chapter twenty. <laughs> Maybe I, I'm just picking out a few things that uh, we can see. <clears throat> First Kings, everybody there? Chapter twenty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First Kings, chapter twenty. Look at verse thirty-three. Everybody found it. What does it say? Okay, I'm not sure what translation you're looking for, but it must be a. New American Standard. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought so. King James. Everybody looking at the King James? It says, Now the men did what? Diligently. The men did diligently observe. You know what that word diligently observe means? It's the same word serpent. Mm -hmm. Same identical word. What does the word nafeshin, nafesh, what does the word mean? It means to learn by experience. It means to diligently observe. You see, if you're diligently observing, you that means you are looking diligently at what I'm showing you and you are observing it. And guess what's happening from that? You're learning. You're learning. That word, diligently observe, is the Hebrew word, nafesh, serpent. And if I read it that way, now the men did serpent. It wouldn't make a bit of sense, does it? Well, see, it don't make a bit of sense when you read Genesis chapter 3, 1, and it says, now the serpent, and you think of a snake on a tree. But if you realize that word means to learn by experience and to diligently observe, because it's in diligently observing and learning by experience that you begin to train yourself so that you can be what God designed you to be. And that's your whole purpose of being in this dimension. is to be what you've designed to be. And without that, if I'm not being what I'm designed to be, guess what? I find myself unhappy. Or I find myself trying to get happy being something, doing da 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 Rather than to be what I've been designed to be. So, you can take that, put that in your peace pipe and smoke it or hatch pipe or whichever kind of you got. And see how that works for you. <laughs> but think about it. Just think about these things. Because we're going to we'll come back here next Sunday and we will pick up and go a little bit deeper into this because it uh, it does the rabbit hole does get much, much deeper. Okay.